What You Need to Know About Markets was written in an editorial in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago. It was called Lessons of the Brain Damaged Investor. And in this editorial, they explain why people with slight brain damage do better as investors than people with normal brain functionality. Why? Because the slightly brain damaged person has no empathy. And that's the key. If you don't have any empathy, you do well as an investor. And so Wall Street breeds people who have no empathy to go in there and to make decisions and make trades that they have no compunction about and no thought whatsoever as that what they're doing might affect their fellow human being. So they breed these robots, these, these people who have no souls. And since they don't even want to pay these people anymore, they're now breeding robots, real robots, real algorithmic traders. Uh, Goldman Sachs and the high frequency trading scandal. They, they put a computer next to the exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. This computer, this co-located computer, as they call it, it front runs all the trades on the exchange and it hits the exchange with, with volumes of orders in ways that scalp pennies and nickels away from the exchange. It just, it's like they're siphoning money all day long. They went one quarter last year, 30 or 60 straight days without a single down day and made millions of dollars every single day. Is that because well, that's statistically impossible? When I worked on Wall Street, the way it works is everyone kicks upstairs the bribes. The brokers bribe to the office manager. The office manager bribes to the regional sales manager. The regional sales manager bribes to the national sales manager. It's a common understanding. At, at Christmas, who gets the biggest bonus at Christmas in an average brokerage office? The compliance officer. The compliance officer sits there all day long. He's supposed to be making sure you don't violate any of the margin rules and you're complying with the law. Of course, yeah, to the extent that you can bribe the compliance officer, yeah, that's right, you are complying with the law. So how does fraud has become the system? It's no longer a byproduct. It, it is the system. You know, it, it's like that old Woody Allen joke. He says, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, take a pill, and that should cure the problem. And he says, no, doctor, you don't understand. We need the eggs. Okay? So... The trading of fraudulent claims back and forth between banks to generate fees, to generate bonuses, has become the, the GDP producing growth engine of the United States economy. Even though they're essentially trading fraudulent claims that there's absolutely no hope of ever paying back. They're processing and generating and resecuritizing nothing. If I write $20 billion on a cocktail napkin and I sell it to JP Morgan, while JP Morgan writes $20 billion on a, a cocktail napkin, and we swap those two cocktail napkins at a bar, and we each pay ourselves a quarter of 1% in a fee, uh, uh, we make a lot of money for our Christmas bonus. We each have on our books a $20 billion cocktail napkin, which has no real value until such time as the system is no longer able to absorb bogus cocktail napkins, and in which case we go to the government to get bailed out. And because of Wall Street and the global stock market, there are now conservatively about $700 trillion of outstanding fraudulent claims known as derivatives, still waiting to collapse, a value amounting to over 10 times the gross domestic product of the entire planet. And while we have seen the bailouts of corporations and banks by governments, which of course comedically borrow their money from banks to begin with, we are now seeing attempts to bail out whole countries by conglomerates of other countries through the international banks. But how do you bail out a planet? There is no country out there that isn't now saturated in debt. The cascade of sovereign debt defaults we have seen can only be the beginning when the math is taken into account. It has been estimated in the United States alone that income tax would need to be raised to 65% per person just to cover the interest in the near future. Economists are now foreshadowing that within a few decades, 60% of the countries on the planet will be bankrupt. But hold on, let me get this straight. The world is going bankrupt, whatever the hell that means, because of this idea called debt, which doesn't even exist in the physical reality. It's only part of a game that we've invented. And yet, the well-being of billions of people is now being compromised. Extreme layoffs, 
tense cities, accelerating poverty, austerity measures imposed, schools shutting down, child hunger, and other levels of familial deprivation, all because of this elaborate fiction. What are we, fucking stupid? Hey, hey, Mars, my man. Help a brother out, huh? Grow up, kids. Saturn, what's up, man? You remember that smoking nebula I hooked you up with a while back? Uh, listen, Ice, we're getting really tired of you. You've been given everything, and yet you waste it all. You got plenty of resources, and you know it. Why don't you grow up and learn some responsibility, for Christ's sake? You're making your mother miserable. You're on your own, pal. Yeah, whatever. Now, all of this considered, from the waste machine known as the market system to the debt machine known as the monetary system, hence creating the monetary market paradigm, which defines the global economy today. There is one consequence that runs through the entire machine, inequality. Whether it is the market system which creates a natural gravitation towards monopoly and power consolidation, while also generating pockets of wealthy industries that tower over others regardless of utility, such as the fact that top hedge fund managers on Wall Street now take home over $300 million a year for contributing literally nothing. While a scientist looking for a cure for a disease trying to help humanity might make $60,000 a year if they're lucky. Or whether it is the monetary system, which has class division built right into its structure. For example, if I have $1 million to spare and I put it into a CD at 4% interest, I will make $40,000 a year. No social contribution, no nothing. However, if I'm a lower class person and have to take loans to buy my car or home, I am paying in interest, which, in abstraction, is going to pay that millionaire with the 4% CD. This stealing from the poor to pay the rich is a foundational, built-in aspect of the monetary system and it could be labeled structural classism. Of course, historically, social stratification has always been deemed unfair, but obviously accepted overall as now 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth. But, material fairness aside, there is something else going on underneath the surface of inequality, causing an incredible deterioration in public health as a whole. Well, I think people are often uh, puzzled by the contrast between the material success of our societies, unprecedented levels of wealth, uh, and the many social failings. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the rates of um, drug abuse or violence or self-harm amongst kids um, or mental illness, uh, there's clearly something going deeply wrong with our societies. What the data that I've been describing does is simply shows that intuition that we people have had for hundreds of years that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive that that intuition is truer than I think we ever imagined there are very powerful psychological and social effects of inequality more to do I suppose with feelings of, inf of superiority and inferiority that kind of division and and maybe going with the sort of respect disrespect people feeling looked down on at the bottom which by the way is why violence is more common in more unequal societies it's the trigger to violence is so often people feeling looked down on and disrespected if there is one principle I can emphasize that is the most important principle underlying the prevention of violence it would be equality. The single most significant factor that affects the rate of violence is the degree of equality versus the degree of inequality in that society. So what one's looking at is a sort of general social dysfunction. Uh, it's not just one or two things that go wrong as inequality increases. 
it seems to be everything, whether we're talking about crime or health or mental illness or whatever. One of the really disturbing findings out in public health there is never ever make the mistake of being poor or being born poor. Your health pays for it in endless sorts of ways, something known as the health socioeconomic gradient. As you move down from the highest strata in society in terms of socioeconomic status, every step down, health gets worse for umpteen different diseases. Life expectancy gets worse, infant mortality rate, everything you could look at. So a huge issue has been, why is it that uh, this gradient exists? Totally simple, obvious answer, which is if you are chronically sick, you're not going to be very productive. So health causes drive socioeconomic differences. Not that in the slightest. On the very simple level that you could look at socioeconomic status of a 10-year-old, and that's going to predict something about their health decades later. So that's the direction of causality. Next one, what's it about? Oh, it's perfectly obvious. Poor people can't afford to go to the doctor. It's healthcare access. It's got nothing to do with that because you see these same gradients in countries with universal health care, socialized medicine. Okay, next simple explanation. Oh, on the average, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to smoke, to drink, to all sorts of lifestyle risk factor stuff. Yeah, those contribute, but careful studies have shown that explains maybe about a third of the variability. So what's left, and what's left is having a ton to do with the stress of poverty. So the poorer you are, starting off being, you know, the person who's one dollar income behind Bill Gates, the poorer you are in this country, on the average, the worse your health is. This tells us something really important. The health connection with poverty, it's not about being poor, it's about feeling poor. Increasing, we, really, we recognize that um, chronic stress is an important influence on health, but the most important sources of stress are the quality of social relations. And if there is anything that lowers the quality of social relations, it is the socioeconomic stratification of society. What science has now shown is that regardless of material wealth, the stress of simply living in a stratified society leads to a vast spectrum of public health problems. And the greater the inequality, the worse they become. Life expectancy, longer and more equal countries, drug abuse, less and more equal countries, mental illness, less and more equal countries, social capital, meaning the ability of people to trust each other, naturally greater in more equal countries, educational scores, higher in more equal countries, homicide rates, less in more equal countries, crime and rates of imprisonment, less in more equal countries, it goes on and on. Infant mortality, obesity, teen birth rate, less and more equal countries. And perhaps most interesting, innovation, greater in more equal countries, which challenges the age-old notion that a competitive, stratified society is somehow more creative and inventive. Moreover, a study done in the UK called the Whitehall Study confirmed that there is a social distribution of disease as you go from the top of the socioeconomic ladder to the bottom. For example, it was found that the lowest rungs of the hierarchy had a fourfold increase of heart disease based mortality compared to the highest rungs. And this pattern exists irrespective of access to health care. Hence, the worse a person's relative financial status, the worse their health is going to be on average. This phenomenon is rooted in what could be termed psychosocial stress, and it is at the foundation of the greatest social distortions plaguing our society today. Its cause? The monetary market system. Make no mistake, the greatest destroyer of ecology, the greatest source of waste and depletion and pollution, the greatest purveyor of violence, war, crime, poverty, animal abuse and inhumanity, the greatest generator of social and personal neuroses, mental disorders, depression, anxiety, not to mention the greatest source of social paralysis, stopping us from moving into new methodologies for personal health, global sustainability and progress on this planet. 
is not some corrupt government or legislation, not some rogue corporation.